Hi everyone, and welcome to episode 50 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sobalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. Yes, it's episode 50, the big 5 Kind of hard to believe, isn't it? But here we are. Peter Kanyanshny from Medievalist.net reminded me this week that of these 50 episodes, I hadn't really dedicated one to one of my own personal favorite subjects, which is Arthurian literature. I've touched on it a few times briefly, but today, Peter sat down with me to talk about some of our favorite Arthurian stories and a little bit about how the story changed over time. Thanks for joining me, Peter. We are going to talk today about King Arthur, right? King Arthur. Yes, yes. Uh, I think we'll talk a little bit about the little history of it and a bit of Arthurian literature. And you've read it all, so we're going to get your picks for like which uh, Arthurian chivalric romances you have to have. Well, I haven't read them all. I haven't read them all. I've read a lot of stuff in English, for sure, because uh, that was my area sort of specialty, but I haven't read all of them. And so you can you can find all the glaring missing holes I have in my in my reading of Arthurian literature as we go. But yeah, we're going to talk about Arthurian literature, which I think is really appropriate because it's our 50th episode. And uh, so it seems like it's a great time to talk about what got me into the Middle Ages in general, which is Arthurian literature. I, like Arthurian is like you, you, as soon as you get into Middle Ages, you, you learn about Arthur in some sort of way. And like, it depends on how, how in depth you go into the tales, but you know, some version of the Arthurian tale. So, Do you remember where you first came across King Arthur? Oh my gosh. I think that would be like Bugs Bunny cartoons and stuff like that really it's like uh you get like those kind of uh little bits of the arthurian tales there so uh way before like i even became a medievalist like you you kind of see it on tv and and movies and things like that so yeah that's how i kind of first dropped into arthurian stuff yeah i think that when we were kids everyone was watching the wonderful world of disney or something on a sunday night at six (laughs) o'clock and uh, i think the sword in the stone was one that came on everyone's disney hour at some point so i think i saw the sword in the stone pretty early did you watch that one i probably did i don't remember it on top of my head but uh, like to me it all just meshes into one kind of blob of a story so (laughs) <laughs> that's, a, that's a good endorsement. So I watched The Sword in the Stone and uh, I didn't realize it at the time as a kid that that one is really, really based on T.H. White's Once in Future King. And um, I didn't really like that movie, to be honest. I liked Arthur a lot, but they had all the, the sections where Merlin is teaching him by changing him into a bird and changing him into a fish and a squirrel, I think. And I was not super <laughs> into that, but I think that was the first time. I heard of Arthur and then being a Canadian girl, probably the second time was reading and watching uh, Anne of Green Gables. And Anne famously, if you've read it or seen it, you'll know that she pretends to be the Lady of Shalott. And of course, it's based on Tennyson's, one of Tennyson's poems. And he wrote a lot about King Arthur and it's really beautiful stuff. But the Lady of Shalott, if you haven't read that one yet, that's a good one. It's barely got Arthur in it at all, but it's it's based on some of the stories of the people who would fall for Lancelot and die from love. Well, when, uh, one thing you, uh, I think will come up is a lot of stories really of Arthurian stuff don't involve Arthur. He's like this secondary character, like... Uh, uh, it's almost like he's it's he's just that that world building that you can kind of base off your story and connect it to him tangentially. But Arthur is is, is often like a minor character in most of these stories. So yeah, he's kind of a shorthand in a lot of ways. Where you're like, this is in the time of King Arthur, and everyone's like, okay, we know where we are, we know what the scenario is, we know what the background is, we know what people are doing. And the funny thing is that if there was a real Arthur, and I'm you know I'm not convinced on this point. Um, he would have been at the early, the early part of the Middle Ages, the early Middle Ages, when the Romans were just leaving Britain. And most of the stories of King Arthur take place in kind of like this perfect 12th century or even later, where people are having jousts and stuff like that, which they were not doing in the early Middle Ages. So Arthur always kind of exists in this space that never really existed in real life. But you're right, like we kind of use him as a shorthand where you know, if you say this is a story about King Arthur, people picture this time of jousts and things like that, even though even in the Middle Ages, this was not really a real time. It was always kind of time outside of time. <laughs> so there is that. But one of the first places you come across Arthur is, of course, Geoffrey of Monmouth's uh, Histories of the Kings, 
of Britain, right? Did you read that one, Peter, back yeah, in the day? I've, I've, I've kind of read through it, and like the first thing that you come, like, come across, it reads like a medieval, standard medieval chronicle where it's this event happens, and this event, and this event, and this event, and it just gets to Arthur. And like, so Geoffrey probably got his uh, a mishmash of different uh, texts and things like that. He, he claims that, that what he did was he translated some other work, some ancient book, but uh, no one really believes that. But it's this kind of history of Britain from uh, settlement by this uh, Trojan uh, leader, uh, Brutus. Yeah, they, they, uh, he comes. He comes, and they have various aspects. They have the Julius Caesar's invasions. They have all these kind of events. And Arthur just is in there. He's part, maybe like a quarter of a, that, that book is just talking about. Oh, here's Arthur fighting this and. Arthur gets real great treatment because he wins all these battles and he conquers all these people. He goes off and he conquers like Scandinavia and Iceland and uh, he defeats everybody. And it's almost like he creates this big empire before his kind of downfall. So, Yeah, yeah. So um, Peter asked me to write an article for Medieval Warfare magazine looking at Arthur, you know, and some of the battles. Well, the last battle, I really focus on the last battle in Geoffrey and Monmouth's and then in Mallory's as well. And I think that what people don't realize is early on, Arthur is not this romance hero. Like, he's a conqueror, like you say, and he's going and he's conquering all over the place and he gets into trouble because the Romans don't like it. And then he's up against the Romans and that's kind of where things fall apart. But I think, you know, you think of the Arthurian story as being a real romance. And at the beginning, it, it wasn't. He was very much a, a conquering king, even though Geoffrey has a lot of the the typical kind of mythological stuff in it, like it has Merlin in it, it has Uther in it, it has that kind of stuff. But Arthur is not the same guy at the beginning as he is at the end of the Middle Ages, which I think is kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah like so like this is like if there's a historical Arthur, they kind of, uh, this is, they're trying to base it as a historical Arthur and, and Jeffrey's care. Uh, so he's kind of set with all these other kind of real and pseudo real people. And it's really something that like English uh, historians, like me medieval English chroniclers, like they kind of, some fall on the, fan the side of, yeah, oh yeah, this is, this is part of the true story and others say, nah, this is, this is just made up. Yeah. And I think that's an important point too, in that we tend to think that this skepticism we have about whether Arthur was a real guy is a modern thing because we're skeptical about everything. But people were skeptical about Arthur back in the day as well, you know, when they're writing chronicle histories. But even William Caxton, he's printing Mallory's version of it. And he's like, well, some people say he's real, but he might be real but he might not be real but either way it's a good story by my book <laughs> yeah I'm sure you can imagine it was a nice debate that they would have in courts right like oh let's what are we going to talk about today oh you think arthur was real <laughs> Who, who's Guinevere really? You know, like <laughs> things like that. So they, I, I, I can just imagine that like it, it, it was kind of a fun kind of talking point. But at the same time, like in that 12th century, they, they find his grave in Glastonbury. There's a physical evidence that he's there. Of course, other people's status, not him. But uh, there's always an effort that he, he is a real person. And I think that's what helps kind of develop this tale is that like somehow you're basing it on a real life person. Yeah, I think it was a bit later that they found it. Like I think it was in the 13th century because Edward the First really made a big giant deal of finding these. They had found these bodies and then he interred them in a really nice tomb to show the Welsh that their once and future king was not coming back. Here he is. He's in the ground. <laughs> so have a look at that, Welshman, which I think was uh, kind of interesting. And um, so we're going to talk about some of our favorite ones. And um, in Geoffrey of Monmouth's version of it, um, he says that he's taken off to Avalon to be healed of his grievous wound. And in Mallory, Mallory says, well, he was taken off to Avalon, but also there is this grave in Glastonbury, so he might have died and he might not have died. But in kind of the middle part of this, after Edward I has buried these bodies, still don't know who these bodies are, um, there's a couple versions of the story of King Arthur that say he's definitely dead. So it's kind of interesting that, that you know, Mallory comes back to this Avalon thing. I think because it's a better story. But, you know, shortly after there has been this whole funeral for him, people are saying, oh, Arthur's dead. <laughs> so it's interesting. All right, Peter. So what are some good books about Arthur's story that you like? Uh, well, there's the kind of next level 
in this uh, storytelling is a guy named Wace. He's this Norman poet and he writes uh, Romain de Brut. Uh, so it's basically, he says, I'm going to do a translation of uh, Jeffrey's Chronicle into French. But what he really does is he expands it. You have the kind of bare bones of Jeffrey. You get all these extra speeches, extra moments, uh, more details. So this is where like, oh, there's a round table. We have that. Oh, this is Excalibur is the name of the sword. Uh, so Wace is like kind of this connection between the, the chronicler version and the romance version. So uh, and like Wace is uh, very verbose. So and medieval people were not really shy or didn't have a problem with adding speeches. <laughs> like you say, like they could be telling a chronicle and they'll just add a whole speech in, even though they know that they're making it up whole cloth. They're all right with doing that because they figure this person would have said something like that. So yeah, this, this is getting expanded and speeches are being added as well. I should mention that before we have Jeffrey, we do have some mentions of Arthur that come up and one of the places that comes up is in Welsh tales as well. And so he, he's there before he becomes kind of, you know, an English king that's in Chronicles as well. So then we have the brute. And the 12th century is where all these stories really blow up, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. You have Chrétien de Troyes. Uh, he comes out with like four, five or six different works. And he's the one that comes up with Lancelot. We start getting a uh, connection between him and Guinevere. Uh, so uh, you've got uh, like a kind of more and more drifting away from Arthur as the main character to all, all these kind of tales involving the Grail. So it seems to blow up because you got him like as he's doing it, there's a whole bunch of other people that are kind of spreading it around. This story just spreads all over Europe, right? So, And I think that it's important to mention Christian de Troyes. He, he does come up with Lancelot. That is something that is out of his own mind. And he is starting to make the story more of a courtly love story. And I think it's a good point that you make where, you know, Arthur's kind of sidelined. And part of that is because he's a perfect king. And you can't tell a story about a perfect king except for he does the perfect things. And it's not really a great story. It doesn't have a lot of conflict in it. It doesn't have a lot of places for him to go. So Lancelot is added. And I think, you know, we're talking about ones that you'd want to recommend people to read. And Lancelot is one that I think people should definitely read because it gives you an idea of what a romance hero was. And it's not our 21st century Avengers type hero. Like the other name of the poem is The Knight of the Cart. And that is because Lancelot, he's on a mission. He's going to go rescue uh, Guinevere. And he's in such a hurry that he takes a ride in a cart. And a cart is just what criminals would be riding in, right? So it's a very a low class thing for a person to do. Like only a desperately in love knight would do such a thing. And Lancelot does a few things. Like he he passes out a lot. He faints a lot. Like when he sees Guinevere's hair or whatever, he'll faint. And this is the same dude who will, um, in the story, he crosses a sword bridge, you know, on his hands and knees and he's bleeding and everything. But he's still a knight who like, paints at sight of his lady's hair so <laughs> i think that lancelot is definitely a good poem for people to read because you it really gives you a sense of what this courtly love ideal was supposed to be so yeah that's that's a good one to read and again this christian is writing in the 12th century near the end of the 12th century another person is marie de france and because uh, she's the one that writes these uh, lays the breton lays and a few of them are like kind of set in arthurian world too right a bunch of them are set in this kind of mythical arthurian time and with the knights that have those values and things like that yeah but arthur's not really featured in them there's uh also a lot of stories that come out of involving the holy grail at this time uh i think christian kind of first kind of says oh there's a an object, a holy thing, uh, and then like other writers just start building on that. Like I love, I love when you look at this is that you get all these kind of just building off one another. Like there's a great German work called Parseval, and apparently that is basically the the writer was taking one of the unfinished works of Christian and say I'm gonna like make a 
big, huge epic, 25,000 words uh, uh, kind of basis on it and just retell that story of Percival, the Knight Percival, and bring that kind of with like his kind of quest for the Holy Grail where he kind of fails and he has to reestablish himself. Like he has to build up himself again to go and and get that ultimate prize. (laughs) I think that the Grail story is important because you do have, I mean, once Lancelot enters the picture, it very much becomes this love triangle, this adulterous love triangle and stuff like that. And people really dig it. They really like this adulterous angle. That's very much what courtly love is about, you know, loving somebody that you cannot attain and, you know, actually being together, but not letting anyone find out. This is the ultimate romance at the time. But even that said, even though, you know, you cheer for Lancelot or whatever, he can't get the Holy Grail. He never gets the Holy Grail. He does not even get close. And that's because, you know, He's existing in this space where he's doing something that is very, very romantic, but also sinful at the same time. So the Holy Grail is a good story in that, you know, you get a look at what is okay, what is romantic, and what is not actually okay to do. Hey, uh, I want to ask you, about a year or two ago, uh, you had got uh, Persephorest, right? That the kind of huge, epic kind of book. I haven't had a chance to look at it. So what what was that about in the Arthurian? That is actually a prequel <laughs> to Arthur. So they talk about Arthur like he's coming. He's coming later. And so they have a lot of really interesting stories in that that are definitely influenced backwards i would say so you know that tradition that that world building has already happened and then they are building stories before that but that one's got cool stories in it um about alexander the great who's like scuba diving and stuff and sees he sees this. i wrote a post about this because i thought it was really cool so alexander the great is going underwater and he sees swordfish that are dueling and that gives him the idea of creating the joust (laughs) i think that's great and also um and also there is the story uh it's the earliest version of the sleeping beauty story that i've seen there might be one that's earlier than that and i wrote a post about this as well but you find out that this this story is actually kind of lancelot's prehistory so read my post about sleeping beauty and you'll see how that leads into lancelot as well but yeah that's kind of a prequel because people couldn't get enough of that and you know how many stories can you tell about the round table well let's go earlier and tell more stories about it now let's let's switch to uh a character we haven't talked about yet gawain my favorite gawain (laughs) so gawain is one of the people who appears really early on so he appears in the welsh mabinogian he's got a different name which i'm totally gonna mangle but i think it's gwalsh may which means something like hawk of may and he's arthur's nephew and he's always arthur's nephew from the beginning to the last stories and you see him everywhere but gawain is such a really interesting character because again you know even if you like lancelot best and i i would say that mallory likes lancelot best you cannot shortchange gawain he's just too important and so he's got a whole bunch of stories that are about him that i really like there's all all sorts of them in middle english early ones late ones my favorite ones which i i've talked about before is sir gawain and dame ragno and that's one where um he has to answer the question what do women really want and he figures it out gawain is he's the best and then the the one that really kind of got me back into the medieval realm when i was not sure what i wanted to do in university is sir gawain in the green knight and that is one that just i've talked about a billion times because i really love it but it's one where gawain he's the best knight at the round table and um he has to really make some difficult decisions because he has sworn oaths in sort of several different directions and i really like this one because you look at these knights who are trying to live up to you know, Arthurian ideals or something, real life knights. But if they swear in one direction and they swear in a different direction, like what happens when these interests cross? And so Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is like a really sophisticated poem that I like because it, I think it deals with like, what do you do when your life is on the line, but you've sworn to uphold certain ideas? So yeah, Mallory doesn't like Gawain, but of course I do. No, I, I like Gawain and the Green Knight. I think it's one like maybe it's like it'd be the first one you might want to read because it's a very self-contained tale. Uh, you don't need to know about the, any of the larger Arthurian legend to it. It's like 
basically they start off it's christmas time they're having a court feast and one thing happens to another and we get this strange character come in and the green knight and uh and the fun begins there so i i've got the translation by uh, J.R.R. tolkien of it so it's written middle english which is i always find that really hard to read so yeah that one's difficult it's um it seems to be contemporary with Chaucer, but because the Middle English that we mostly see is from London, then something like Gawain, which is which is written further north, it's more challenging to read. So if you are not familiar with Middle English, the translation by Tolkien, it's, it's beautiful. And it really preserves a lot of the alliteration, which was a big part of the original poem. There's only that one manuscript survives of this tale. So, like, we don't know if it had any kind of larger than, uh, like, was spread out even further, or it was just, like, this one person wrote it, and, you know, he just did a really, really good job. <laughs> so, uh, and it's just kind of this gem. But, you know, we wish there was, like, more of these kind of tales. Although, there, like, there literally are probably, like, hundreds of different kind of versions of various Arthurian tales out there and like some are very similar and just uh, you know a little bit of changes uh, like I, I remember when, when we were kind of doing research like there's a Hebrew version from like uh, uh, 13th century Italy of, the, of a couple of the tales where there's a little bit of uh, Jewish uh, customs kind of built into the uh, into the story stuff like that but uh, so yeah lots of these kind of you know one-off tales and stuff like that that yeah, they're very adaptable in the way kind of like Shakespeare is very adaptable and that you have these kind of stock characters that can be reworked and reused and stuff like that. The one thing I do want to say about the Gawain manuscript is I saw it at the British Library and I did cry <laughs> because you only ever see it in black and white and here it was in full color. And also I could see from looking at the manuscript how often people had read that. You could see from the fingerprints and oils in the dirt, you could see people loved this, which was really great, but it only does survive in one copy. But there are there are a whole bunch of stories, as Peter is saying, a few of my favorites. I do recommend uh, the team's Middle English series. They have... One volume called King Arthur's Death, which has the Middle English stanzaic Mort, uh, Mort Arthur and the alliterative Mort Arthur. And those are both really good ones. Some of the ones that I really liked are Marie has her ladies, which are quite good. One of them was L'Enfant, which I read. You can find that in Middle English as L'Enfant. But there's another one that is really cool, and it's called Sir Orpheo. And that survives in a couple of different places. And it's basically the story of Orpheus in the underworld, but it's been adapted, like we're talking about, to the Arthurian story. And so instead of someone dying and being taken to the underworld, um, in Sir Orfeo, Orfeo's wife falls asleep under a grafted tree, which you should never do if you are living in that time. In the King Arthur time, not the real time. But she falls asleep under a grafted tree and she's taken away by, I think it's the king of the fairies. And so Orfeo has to go and find her. He's a musician and, you know, he has to play the song. And uh, he does have to bring her back without looking back which is kind of a cool story you know it's one that's that's really great from ancient greece and then it's really great when you see it as a north Korean story as well the other kind of tales are like there's uh lots of kind of versions like there's stuff that goes up into scandinavia like say when the norwegian kings decide that they want to be more european like this first thing is oh let's get some arthurian tales and get it into our language uh so there's icelandic versions of some of these tales and they're starting to get translated now so that's that would be kind of really interesting to see uh, those kind of works uh, come come along because you see the icelandic bent of arthur and his knights so yeah, because it does adapt, like we're saying, and it brings in different cultural aspects as well. So, you know, probably the most famous one is this courtly love angle, which was a trend. People were re talking about King Arthur as being a conqueror, and all of a sudden he's kind of a cuckolded husband because of this love story. And like you say, people are bringing in Jewish aspects. People are talking about ancient Greek stuff. People are talking about Icelandic stuff. And when you look at it closely, like you say, translating it from its original language you see these little kind of cultural aspects of it which which are really really cool <laughs> the the icelandic ones do you remember when they were written like those would come out like in the 13th and 14th centuries eric and Aeneid, it becomes like eric saga and stuff like that again they're kind of just 
built off like of this demand i guess within icelandic society for these kind of tales right you know we have italy we have middle dutch versions of it we have a lot of middle uh, like medieval german works as well so it really kind of spreads out and like i'm sure like you know i'm sure like we're kind of missing out like spanish and central european things like that but it's, it just tells you how, you know, how well it, it traveled uh, and something that people wanted to have consume and consume in their own in, in their own language, too. Right. Yeah. And it's kind of funny because it was something that came out of people's culture and it was something that they explored as part of their culture. And then it started to reflect back and it started to change culture as well, because, you know, in the 14th century, um, Edward III is starting to create his Order of the Garter, which is kind of based on this Arthurian idea. We're going to have the best knights. They're going to go on quests and stuff like that. The Order of the Star in France, where you were supposed to go away and have adventures and then come back once a year and tell everybody about your adventure. <laughs> so it's like, it's come from a culture it's, and it's reflecting back to that culture. And then it's starting to change culture as well. And I do think we, we shouldn't imagine that actual medieval knights followed that kind of courtly idea because it was an ideal but they were hoping to live up to this standard of of knightly perfection because all of arthur's knights are supposed to be as close to perfect as possible just kind of finish out into the middle ages we have this work by uh, sir thomas mallory and this seems to be like the epitome of Arthurian literature for, for many. I haven't had a chance to read very much of it, so I can't really comment on it. But it's basically almost kind of alone. Uh, like it seems that there's not very much happens after it. So it's like this is the great work of Arthurian literature. It's where everything gets put together in a nice little bow. Although it's just, again, it's based off of other kind of stuff. But Mallory is... Uh, would, would they think he, he's, he also served as a soldier, so he had some experience, and he kind of reworks again uh, all the kind of some of the famous tales. And I think a lot of our, a lot of the basis of like modern views is based really on Mallory's conception. Yeah, and so a lot of that is because Mallory's version of the Arthurian myth, so just the Mort d'Arthur, it it was printed. So it really got a huge distribution. And so people weren't kind of just kind of orally telling Arthurian stories anymore. They could have one copy of a printed book in their hands. So Mallory's writing in the 15th century. It seems that he was a soldier from, from what scholars have figured out. And he was also a rogue. Like he wasn't a super nice guy. He wrote. <laughs> a lot of the Mort Arthur in jail, we think. So he wasn't like a super nice guy. But it does kind of signal the end of the Middle Ages in that in the 15th century, warfare had changed and people are using guns a lot more. They're using cannons a lot more. And it doesn't look like it did or people thought it should have in the 14th century. So when Mallory's writing this, he's being nostalgic. So he's looking back at this mythical time as being the perfect time for knights when they were honorable and they were they had all this prowess they were amazing on the battlefield and they always did the right thing even if the right thing was you know kind of an adulterous thing and so when you read Mallory it's almost hilarious now because he will say something like well there's this knight and he was the best knight ever and then there's this knight and he was also the best knight ever and then there's this knight he was also the best knight ever <laughs> and so like they are all amazing and they're all fighting each other but he does make some political commentary as he as he goes on saying you know this these were the days when people were real knights and this is what real knighthood was like so he's reading it being nostalgic which i think between that and print culture I would guess that's why Arthur kind of fell out of fashion. He was already kind of passé, which is why which is why Mallory was writing in the style that he was writing. But he is Mallory is super influential. So when we talk about Tennyson again, he was writing following Mallory as well. And like you say a lot of people are following Mallory now too. After that, like you don't really get very much like Arthurian literature like it, he seems to yeah, fall out of fashion like Henry VIII's older brother was named Arthur. So that was kind of still, he was still kind of trendy at that time, but then it started to, like you say, fall out of fashion. It kind of dies down, like kind of interest in him until, what, the 19th century, right? And then this revival. Yeah, and that revival in the 19th century is based on nostalgia, right? This was a simpler time. People had honor. It's kind of a commentary on the Industrial Revolution when things are starting to move forward and be ugly and urban and things 
this nostalgia back to the time when you'd have knights errant that are just kind of wandering around <laughs> and uh, saving people. That was those were the days. <laughs> they uh, and then you get Mark Twain comes in with uh, like a knight in King Arthur's court uh, where a person time travels back to it, but it's uh, uh, he's making fun uh, of that period and how everyone's so stupid and uh, ignorant. But his main character, I don't think, succeeds right. You have that, so you have that really great, and then we just kind of carries on like we're like now you know people just kind of make versions uh, where they kind of set like whatever the values of Arthur are the present day values, right? So that's what you see in the twentieth century and the twenty first, and now now it's like movies. Yeah, now it's a lot of movies, and and you do see. Well, we can't forget T. H. White, who's writing the Once and Future King, between Mark Twain and and the movies, but the movies, like you say, they do talk about Arthur in terms of what the values are, right? There's that one first night with Sean Connery. Everything is like super shiny and things like that. And then there's the one with Clive Owen where everything is super gritty and they have to make it realistic. And he cannot be a chivalrous king. You know, he has to be what historians might or might not think he was, right? Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, like the, the Clive Arthur, like someone like, oh, let's let's talk like that. Let's try and find this historical King Arthur. So he's almost like, oh, he's a Roman soldier, right? I think the, the latest movie of King Arthur was the one where he He's, uh, you know, almost like a rebel. Oh, I totally forgot about that one. Um, Charlie, what's his last name? <laughs> I totally forgot. Jude Law's a bad guy. Yeah, he's yeah. Vortigern. He's not a bad guy. Well, he is a bad guy, but he's not the bad guy in the Arthurian legend. And then, uh, full disclosure, I did not watch that one. Oh, I did. I did. I, again, you know, he's, it's like. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> It is a very forgettable film, but in essence, like he, instead of being, uh, you know, this high and mighty noble Arthur, you know, he's a, one of the commoners and like he wants to just do good. That's that's what he is. So. Yeah, I think that's important, too, that the King Arthur nowadays, he doesn't want to be king. He doesn't want to be king. It's it's too much. Nobody should have that much power, which I think is kind of hilarious because, you know, in the Middle Ages, Everyone was like, okay, he's the king. And we have a divine sign that he's the king because he's taken the sword from the stone. So, which I think is a great story, by the way. The sword in the stone where he doesn't have a sword for his foster brother, doesn't realize he's the king, and he goes and runs to get the one <laughs> that's, that's closest, which is the one that is whoever pulls this sword is going to be the next king of England. He just grabs it because he needs it. And I just think that's a great story. <laughs> People say, like, why can't we just do like a version of Mallory? or a version of Monmouth and be really faithful to that, right? It's, you know, people just wouldn't understand the the motives and values of people back in the Middle Ages in, like, the sense of, like, you know, Arthur, this is like, Arthur, I always should be rule, yes, you know, like, the, of course I should be king. And Guinevere, uh, you know, no, you know, she's my, my wife and property, you know, she can't, uh, you know, have, like, a, her own social license, right? That would be accepted back in, like, the, the medieval texts and stuff like that, like, with, what Guinevere does is wrong or what Lancelot does is wrong. And now like these are heroes and they, these are what their actions, you know, they true love and things like that are compatible with what we have today, but they are not compatible with the kind of texts from before. So, yeah, I think a big part of that story that doesn't translate very well is the courtly love angle because so the most, most recent one that I've read is the version by Mallory and he he says, you know, Agravain, who's Gawain's brother, says, Lancelot and the Queen, they're getting it on. We need to tell Arthur. And Gawain's like, nope, nope, nope. We shouldn't, we shouldn't even get involved in that. And you kind of get the sense that everybody knows what's going on. But they're saying, we should not bring this to his attention because if we bring this to Arthur's attention publicly, he has to do something about that. And that is going to tear the kingdom apart. You see that not just in Mallory, there's in a whole bunch of other ones. But like I said, that's the one I've read most recently. But no, I think that's a hard thing for modern people to understand. Like, no, let's let this adulterous affair go on because we cannot, we can't make it public. It's just going to be a disaster. And of course it is a disaster. And I think that the funny thing is, I didn't mention this in the article, so I'll mention this now. When Lancelot is discovered in the Queen's Chambers, in Mallory, he's not discovered kind of caught red-handed, let's say, but he's discovered there. And um, he says, and throughout, like everybody knows that he and the Queen have been getting it on, but he keeps saying, 
I haven't done this and then I will prove it on my body. So he keeps saying to everyone, I'm innocent and I will fight you to the death for it. So he's trying to take on this whole judicial combat thing, which I think is kind of kind of interesting because if he was to do that, God should technically strike him down as being a liar because he has done the thing he's accused of. And it's kind of it's kind of bold of him to say, I haven't done this, even when we know that he has as a reader we know that he has it's very kind of interesting to say that he's gonna go and actually prove this on his body because uh, that's not how it should work if he does that he should be struck down (laughs) but he knows he's the best knight and he won't be so it's it's a really kind of weird thing i think if you ask like anyone out there like even with like only only a small passing understanding of arthurian like lancelot is a big hero that's how he gets portrayed now but in the in the medieval texts, he is a quasi villain, right? He's uh, uh, he's one that's often responsible for destroying everything that like he gets to blame. Uh, he's he's uh, a fallen character more. And today, his character is now seen as just a good person that just goes with his heart. Yeah, it's there's a lot of things that are different. Um, that would make, like you say, having a straight version of it, like straight from the text, it would be it would be something that, you know, maybe audiences wouldn't like that much. And I do think that some things have changed. I remember doing the seminar where I, I did Arthurian literature in university kind of for the first time. Um, there was one person who is very, very against Lancelot because of the horses. And that is because... In the poem Lancelot, like I said, he's in a hurry and he rides his horse to death. And then he comes across Gawain and says, can I borrow a horse? And Gawain's like, sure, man, I've never seen you before, but borrow my horse. I go for it. And then like Gawain gets further down the road and finds out Lancelot's ridden that horse to death. And now he has to get into a cart and continue on his way. And this one person was like, I know. He's treated these horses so badly. But in the Middle Ages, you would have been like, yeah, I mean, he's in such a hurry. He's killed these horses. He must really be serious. But she liked Gawain better because Gawain in Sir Gawain and the Green Knight has a very nice horse named Gringolet, which is nice. And so, you know, culturally, we do see some different things when we look at these um, now. So what other what other things might you want to say about Arthur before we before we sign off? Hey, uh, you know, I'd say uh, read the article that you're going to have in Medieval Warfare magazine. Uh, we're, we're just finishing it up. Uh, I'd say Wikipedia, the uh, how historical it is, because it's very thin. So just have that in the back of your mind. I don't know if Jeffrey of Monmouth is probably, it's probably a bit too dry to be like the first one that you want to read. You probably want to start off with like Chrétien de Troyes. Uh, I, ooh, that's a good one. Christian doesn't really focus on Arthur. So the story of Arthur's history that I really like, I really like these teams ones, but they are in Middle English. The the um, Middle English stanza, Mort, D'Arthur, and the alliterative one. I really like those ones. If you have to read it, and you know what? You should read Sir Gawain and the Green Knight because <laughs> it's not really focused on Arthur, but... First of all, Tolkien's translation is beautiful, but it gives you kind of a sense of of what these knights were like, what they were about, what they were up against. Uh, A lot of the figures that you come across in it, the villain, the lady, they're very typical of Arthurian romance, and uh, it's just a beautiful story. So yeah, start. you could start there. You could start with Mallory. Jeffrey isn't, he's not that dry when he talks about Arthur. But yeah, if you're looking for like just general round table, you can start with Mallory, but then immediately go to places like Chrétien. His stuff is is beautiful. Marie de France, her stuff is beautiful. Middle English romances are beautiful as well. So you're saying Wikipedia to see, you know, what's the thin evidence that he was a real person. I think it's kind of like Caxton said when he was printing Mallory. He said, it's not necessary to believe that he was a real person to enjoy the stories. And maybe it's better to not even, not even try to believe he's a real person to enjoy the stories. It's something where, like, uh, if you dip your toe into it, like, if you, let's say, read Sir Gavin and Green Knight, you'll get a nice, enjoyable. But if you really expand it, you'll find a lot of the stories have similarities. They're kind of based off each other. But it's, uh, I would say, it's almost like if you were a big comic book fan and you wanted to get into the Marvel Universe. Well, 
uh, you'll find like there like there's various versions of Spider-Man, uh, his stories and all his battles. So like that's what you're kind of entering, right? You're getting versions where it's a continuation or built on or a retelling of these particular characters. You get some new characters every once in a while introduced and you get like kind of side side stories like Tristan. If you want to go into it, you can go a little bit or you can really go ahead into it uh, headlong because I know we go to these uh, conferences and people talk about Arthurian stuff all day long. So Yeah, I could talk about this stuff all day long. I love this stuff. But um, that is a really good point. And I actually made that point on Twitter a couple of weeks ago where a lot of the stuff, it's like Avengers. When you start to assemble assemble them all together, you have all the individual stories which you have to kind of have a sense of. You know, in order to really understand the big picture, but then you see this guy is the best and this guy is the best and this guy is the best, but they are all kind of making one big picture, which works really well. Do you have thoughts on this being the 50th episode of the podcast? Hey, uh, I can, well, first of all, congratulations. Like, Thank you. It's... Uh, you know, we started it just over a year ago, uh, and uh, so far it's been a real big success. Like people are coming more and more for each episode. It seems that our audience is growing, and they seem to enjoy you. So enjoy your guests uh, uh, <laughs> as well. I enjoy them too. Try to bring it every week. What what is new? Speaking of bringing it every week, what's new on the the website this week? Do we know? Oh, not much this week. This was uh, what we call like working on the back end week. We've been having uh, some slight little problems with the uh, posts, uh, getting these things in. Me and my tech guy have uh, been working on putting it into a new uh, server. So uh, hopefully if you actually go on the site, uh, you might notice it one millisecond faster. But uh, <laughs> they, we've kind of upgraded. Uh, so there wasn't too much. We posted a couple of news bits uh, this week, but uh, I have been, you know, kind of busy actually working with Medieval Warfare magazine, trying to get that issue out. So, and I've let my tech guy kind of fix up the site. But we should be back and in the next days. I'll stay, a couple of days. I'll have some posts to come out to come out as Valentine's Day comes approaches. We sometimes get uh, some romantic stuff uh, here on Medievalist.net. That's true. That's true. And we're talking about romance today. One of the things that I should mention before we go, and that is um, you reposted something that I wrote, gosh, close to 10 years ago about Lancelot keeping his T-shirt. And, you know, it's funny, these things that you write and would write differently now. I do think Lancelot can keep his T-shirt. I'm team Gawain all the way. But it was posted on Facebook and somebody put a really nice thread. I've forgotten her name right now. Talking about how, you know, I I haven't read enough French literature, which which is also true. But um, it's a really good thread. Even though she thinks perhaps I have not done a good job on that article. And you know, it was a really long time since I wrote it. But um, her thread is really good. If you're on Facebook, you can see under Lancelot can keep his t-shirt. Somebody is talking about the reasons we should like Lancelot and that maybe they're not the same as mine were 10 years ago. So that is a good thread to read. Yeah. <laughs> well, we always have like like a lot of content. We have, yeah, we have all these articles by you. The site is now 15,000 posts uh, of content and there's no shortage. <laughs> yeah, there's always more good stuff on Medievalist.net. So you can check it out. All right. Thanks, Peter, for coming and talking to me about King Arthur. Pleasure to have you. Thanks. Thank you to all our patrons at patreon.com for helping us to get to 50 episodes with your support. If you love this episode, you can help this little podcast keep going by signing up for a digital or paper subscription to Medieval Warfare magazine, an ad-free desktop version of Medievalist.net, or our book club with Boydell and Brewer. Or you can just kick in a single dollar every month. Every bit is most appreciated. Check it out at patreon.com slash medievalists. Thank you also and big love to my Canadian readers who have managed to buy all the stock of my new book, Life in Medieval Europe, Fact and Fiction, at Indigo. If you haven't yet got a copy, you can find it and my other books on Amazon, although I'm happy to say that their stock is getting low too. Thank you to everybody who's left such kind reviews. If you love the book, let me know by leaving your own review or by reaching out on social media. For more than 15,000 articles about the medieval world, including some by yours truly about Alexander the Great scuba diving and the medieval sleeping beauty, you can always follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Savalski, across social media at 5MINMedievalist or 5MinuteMedievalist. 
Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Gee Frog. Thank you for listening to one episode or 50. Have yourself an amazing day.